Hello everybody, this is The Cap and welcome to my talk. Today we're going to be talking about, please be lazy, some coding automation lessons that I just learned during my career. Um, before I start talking about this, I'm going to give you some introduction and some context about the problem that I've been trying to solve today. Uh, the first thing is when I just start coding, I had to type every single character when I was developing a solution, especially because it it made me feel that I was like a hacker, that I was able to provide enough the right solution to the problem that I was trying to solve. So every single character, when I was trying to type and when I was trying to code something, I had to type it. Um, after some time, I just realized that, okay, you know what? I'm rewriting the same sentences every day. You know, like when I was writing the loops, when I was writing the variable definition, even the name of the functions, I just realized like, okay, I'm rewriting everything. Um, do we have like any solution to do that? So that's what came to my mind. And on top of that, I just realized also that I was solving similar problem. And you know, like sometimes when you have to solve the same specific button um, problem, the, the same button, you know, for different companies, the same form, the same function, the same React hook, you realize, okay, this is kind of similar. Even like I'm working for two different projects in two different companies, I was trying to solve the same specific problem. And sometimes I just forgot how I solved it in the past. And I was forced to go to my search engine again and just just to realize like there was a bunch of purple, purple result that it means like I already checked those solution and just to try to find the same answer that I already find in the in the past. Um, so about this talk, after with all those that context, the idea with this talk is I'm gonna talk about some automation tools that will help you to focus in the problem that you're trying to solve and spend less time on the keyboard with keystrokes. Um, the idea is you know, like if you can automate this this process in somehow, so you won't be forced to revisit those specific purple links, or you won't be able to you know uh, basically you will save time for yourself in the future. Um, before moving forward, I just want to do three different definitions here, and especially because I'm gonna be using these words um, during the talk. So the first thing is boilerplate. Uh, when I say boilerplate, boilerplate, it refers to static code, something that will help you to generate the solution that you will try to create. Let's say that you are talking about React, so you want to introduce a new hook. So when, when you need to create a new hook, you need to create a function. And with that specific function, and let's say that you want to use a single state, so you will need to write down some specific code for that one as a starting point, and that's a boilerplate. And in the same way, you have snippet. Uh, the snippets are like, template it's similar to the boilerplate but in this case it's like you have a, an, an string right when when you say boilerplate you can refer to multiple files uh, let's say that you have mpx or you have query app app or you have the ngcli tool that will able to generate a new service or a new class function uh, class component and so uh, in the snippet is limited to a single file and it will help you to generate like a pretty fine uh, template for your comments, uh, for your code. So saying that it's like we have Emmet, for instance, uh, in VS Code, we have the snippets, or if you are more into the JetBrains tools, so you can use live templates. And the final word that I want to talk about is the linter. And basically a linter is a set of tools that will alert the developer about possible problems with your code that could be related with problems of the code that will break in the future or could be like things that won't break the code 
but that will ha will lead in a bad spirit in the application that you are working on. Um, so basically, when you are in development time, you will get some kind of notification on top of your code, and that's a linter. Um, so what's the question? How can I generate the boilerplate to start a new project? Um, find like the solution that I need and I spend less time in the search engine and for sure less time typing. Uh, and the answer is with automation. The idea is we need to use all the different resources that we have available and all our development knowledge in order to develop our own tooling in order to automate our day-to-day -day work. Um, so this is like a summary about everything that, that, that we will talk about. Um, the first thing is we have um, the linters and the idea is to highlight errors. And in order to highlight errors, so there are different libraries right now, different tools available. For instance, we have ESLint. So um, if you go to the slides, you will see some URLs related here. So for instance, this one is the ESL that I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about, and as you see, if there is a problem, let me just reload this. This is just an example that you have here. You will get this red line here and some suggestion. So basically that's a linter. But for sure, ESL is like, the tool that I saw everywhere and everybody is using this, at least in the projects that I have been working. Uh, but also there are like some tools that you could consider like ROM, this one, or JS Hint. And it's just to have like different options in terms of uh, highlighting. Um, for sure, we, we will be talking about auto, uh, auto formatting, right? So we have Prettier and in the same way, I mean, ESLIN offer you some kind of auto formatting. And also you should consider ROM because in the end, you, what what they are trying to create is with ROM, like the, the only tool that you need in order to automate everything. And for sure there is Google sta uh, company standards, things that you need to define. Uh, and we have the Git hooks and finally the documentation. Um, so, this is just like a, a reminder, like even though like we will be talking about automation, uh, the idea is you have to stop wasting time in the code review of the, uh, a, while when you are doing a code review, you don't want to waste time reviewing the code standards that you just defined. And that's why we have linters, we have auto formatters, and we have documentation that somebody can read and they can get enough knowledge and you don't need to lose time on those things when you are reviewing the, the code of your faults. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to take some time in order to set up all the tools that we will be talking here. Sometimes it's responsibility of the developer, but sometimes it's responsibility of the team. So you as the lead developer, or the architect developer, even like I, I saw some manager in the past that spent some time like kind of set, defining this tooling because in the end you are helping all the developer to make less mistakes. Um, so about code standards, when I say code standards, it's something like this one. So Google, for instance, they have like a huge list of standards. You will see uh, this style guide here, um, basically, if you want, for instance, here in JavaScript, you will see all these conventions that they have here. This is just the convention that they define and it's worth it for you in your project and in your company to have this kind of definition, especially because what you want to have is the same reading experience in all the project. So you, it, it will be easy for you to read the code. So the, this kind of code standards is a good practice to have even though like you need to write down these kind of things uh, later by the end of the talk, I, I'm gonna show you some tools that will help you to generate these code standards based in some context and that kind of stuff. Um, for sure, this is where the linters, uh, this is the starting point of your linter configuration. 
even though like ESLint provide you some recommendations, it could be the it could be up to the team to define how they feel comfortable working with these kind of uh, uh, standards. Because in the end, it's like how everybody feel comfortable reading the code, and you can automate all these rules using any of the linter tools that I just show you. So you can use ESLint, JS Hint, or even ROM in order to set up all the different rules like this one. Like um, uh, you don't want to have the curly braces here. You, you just want to have something like this. Uh, if you have something like this, you will get an alert because it's not allowed, as you see here. Um, basically, that's like one of the conventions that you could set up everything here. So. Uh, please spend some time when you are defining the code standard, not only in writing down all the different rules or, or create a wiki page where everybody could read, right? This is like the first step. But to be honest, if I have to go back to this page every time that I need to ensure that I'm writing the code in the right way, so I'm going to lose too much time. And that's why we have the linter tools. Huh? So you can just set up the configuration for the, the linter and you will have your code standard in your uh, code editor that you want. Um, now, uh, I, I mentioned the snips. Um, basically with the snips, uh, what you have is a way to generate um, a string based in some configuration that you have. Um, this snip that I, I show in here is uh, the configuration. This is the way that you generate snips in VS Code. And it's as simple as create your JSON file. And within the JSON file, you can specify uh, the word FC because this is your prefix. And here you will see this array here and every uh, entry here within the, um, the array is one of the lines. So for this, uh, for, for instance, for this one, I have my functional component on React, and I would like to create a functional component with some interface in TypeScript. So this is my starting point. So when I got this, so I'm gonna get cons. This is to I'm gonna have here in VS Code like an empty space where you can write down the name of the function that you want to create. And for sure you have here the name of the props that you will create. So it's kind of um, easy and straightforward to define these SNP components. And even though like this is a simple example of the SNP, you can create whatever you want here. You could imagine like you have your own library that will have some special properties here, or it will require some interfaces. So you can create this kind of SNPs and this is more in the developer side. Like if you want to say something in the future and you don't want to repeat yourself in order to generate this for a configuration, or if you don't want to spend some time um, like redoing the same UI in multiple pages because you have to replicate the same UI in multiple pages or in the backend side, if you need to replicate the same mapping in your data. So you can do that with some snip and you will say sometime in the future. Uh, my rule here is every time that I do the same thing, think like twice. So I just define, okay, let's define my own snip here. And um, well, uh, and depending on the company, I, you, you will have like a bunch of, of snips and it's just a simple JSON file. Um, here, like creativity is the important word here. You can create snips for every common problem that you have. And uh, some ideas here, let's say for the React word, you can create some context with TypeScript. Um, so in that way, the next time that you need to integrate a new context with your components, so you can create like everything by just typing three or four different word uh, letters and just tap and you will have the context with types. Um, or let's say if you are more in the CSS world, so how about to create a grid layout, including the HTML container, container. So you will have like your own class names and you will generate the grid layout for, I don't know, three or four columns. And you have an, a, within the same snip, you will have another snip that is related. And on this time it's just to generate the container. So you know how to um, uh, inject the images within your grid. 
Um, and finally, another idea is, okay, how I'll assign testing. So yeah, I mean, testing is something that takes some time for you and you will find like, if you want to test the same functionalities within the multiple components, it's kind of the same kind of testing. You need to create a mock for the data and you need the mock file and you need to, you know, intercept the assigned petitions to the server and just return like some mocking. And here, I mean, you can uh, create something really specific for the framework that you have in your company or for the data that you have, let's say like you want to generate a random user uh, or something like that. So you can do things like that just with snips. Um, now, uh, sometimes is like a little bit more complicated because you want to add not only a template, but also you want to add some specific functionality here. Uh, you want to execute some specific tasks before generating the files that you want. So um, when when you are talking about like adding behavior here, so you need your own CLI and that's what I say. Um, um, right now we have like this specific framework that is just an open source framework that will help to generate you CLI um, L programs, let's say. So uh, you could imagine like we have the ng command for Angular application, or you have the create React app uh, tool in the prompt where you can just type and generate a new component or generate a new service or generate a new form component, wherever you want. But for the specific project that you, you have, it could be possible that we need to generate our own CLI. And fortunately, we have this CLI framework. And in the end, it's like you can read all the different commands in a more straightforward way because you can do this with no JS, with no troubles. But for this one, it's like you have a specific framework about how to define the templates and what's the logic that you want to run on on everything that you want to do here. And that's what I really like when I have to generate my own tooling for this specific company. Let's say uh, I need to integrate here Faker because I need to generate uh, a bunch of users or, or something so I, I can do something like this. Or uh, as I mentioned, if you want to have mock data here just to test this specific view so that you can generate here uh, a static content here. And after you run this one, you will support the users, let's say the user information within an array. You can do things like that here that is really specific for the for your project. And that are, that are things that are kind of repetitive work. Um, this is kind of just an example about how to use this. And this is just the portion that hold the template. So for this one, it's like, uh, you have all the different flags. You can read the arguments. And here, when the application runs, so you can do where you want, create new files, add uh, reading existing files, for instance. And when you read the existing files, you can add, like, I don't know, inject the service within the uh, uh, Angular uh, component. Uh, I don't remember right now the name of that specific component that holds all the different components, but basically you can edit the the single file uh, or if you are in a React application, let's say that you want to add this library here and you need to add a specific configuration at the global uh, file so you can do that kind of stuff. You just read the file here and after you read the file here, remember that here we are in a Node.js environment so you can do whatever you want with your static files. And that's the beauty of these CLI tools. Uh, you can create multiple files. You can edit the existing one. I mean, you are not limited here to add a specific file. You can do where you can add new behavior. You can fetch data from a different server if you want to read the database just to update some information here. That's that came to my mind. So ideas here, as I mentioned, well, fake data, create mock, uh, so you can test your component. You can add new components that will have the standards uh, that you define with your team or that could add, you know, like that UI library, um, those, that UI library that you create or the backend library that you have could have some specific methods that on some specific configuration. So you can add that when you are creating your component. And finally, 
uh, remember that you can create new projects. Let's say that you have a monolith that uh, I, I've been working in different companies that what they have is a huge monolith and they could add like least different projects order. And you can define your own scaffolding or there like, like, let's say that you have smart components, UI components, or whatever component that you need, uh, data components, you have uh, the socket class, I don't know, whatever you want order. And you can create boilerplate with these kind of uh, CLI tools. Uh, now, if you want to ensure that you have a quality in your code, um, you need to automate somehow the validation of everything that we have been talking about, the linter, the auto formatters, and everything else. Um, even like the testing part. Um, right now, I, uh, I've been working on a bunch of different projects and most of them use Git. Um, I just find a single project that use Subversion as the, um, the well, the history, the, the way to preserve the history of the code. So, because I know that uh, I've been talking about all the Git hooks here and there are some tasks that could be executed in one part of the Git process. So let's say before generating the commit, when you generate the commit, when you push your changes to the remote server, and those kind of hooks that will help you to generate, uh, to have code quality. And why you can ensure code quality here? Uh, it helped you because in the end, uh, it will alert the user with early validation. And if you have early validation in your project, that's something really cool because you don't need to wait for a code review or you don't, you don't need to wait to break production or the staking environment just to realize that something is wrong. And that's why you can have early validation. And the best way to put that is when you are trying to migrate, uh, integrate your code within the base. Uh, so some ideas here. Let's say that you have a team that they have a disagreement in the formatting. Uh, if you have this auto formatting tool that run in any of the pre-commits, let's say uh, before pushing, you auto format all the files. So in that way, every file in the remote server will have the formatting that you want. So the developer in their local environment could have any format they want. Uh, they will be worried about anything related with the uh, format. Or uh, another idea is you can standardize the way that you write down the comic message, including the issue number or like some kind of description that help you to understand what's the change. So you can help them uh, and you can, you know, when you execute the pre-commit messages, you can help them to generate those messages. And finally, uh, and I, th I think that the most important part here when you are talking about Git hooks and what to automate there is the testing. It includes like run the all the unit testing for your components, visual testing, um, regressions uh, that you could run when you are before merging everything you can run, let's say chromatic or uh, an storybook that like alert of changes and the developer needs in somehow to um, understand the process and, and say, okay, you know, there is some changes here. I would need some approval uh, from the UI, UI perspective or or things like that. Um, um, another portion here that uh, uh, this is kind of new when I was thinking on all of them, it was like, I don't know, like five or seven years ago, uh, we didn't have any AI application. Uh, and now artificial intelligence, it's trendy. Uh, it's something like everybody is aware these days. And you know, like you have different solutions with the, when they just release GitHub uh, Copilot, um, a bunch of tools like chat GPT from OpenAI, or even the Ghostwriter for Replit or Tab9, those have different solutions that will help developers to generate new new code. Um, I've been reading like 
uh, from different ways here, uh, from different sources. I've been reading like some people doesn't like and they feel a little bit afraid about what's the future of this. But the truth is this kind of tool will help us to automate everything in a better way. If you see, we define different templates, you can create your own CLI and you can do like this integration with your commit messages and using the GitHub's in, in order to generate um, some automation here. But how about if we have a way to have these computers, not only to use our templates or use our own automation, but also to help the developers with new ideas about how to solve the problems, to help the developers to generate their own scaffolding uh, or like just suggestion based on the code that the, the developer have. And that's why we have the artificial intelligence on place. And this kind of artificial intelligence, I mean, you need to be confident about this new generation of tools. And when you are talking of automation, it's impossible to don't talk about artificial intelligence because in the end, I mean, what, what is happening here is you can provide enough context about the problem that you are solving right now, enough context about the company that you are working on. And in the end, these tools will help you with a day-to-day -day, uh, and repetitive task, like generate fake data because, well, you can train the model in order to do that. And I mean, if you don't want to use this uh, commercial application that we have here, you can create your own artificial network and it's not that hard. And right now we have like all these frameworks and in the future, I will sell the near future and you will see a uh, different solution here, focus on different companies. And my message here is don't be close to this new um, uh, application, especially if you are a lazy de developer like myself that want to integrate, uh, automate everything and that, that you want to contribute in so how to the company in the fastest way instead of thinking of repetitive tasks. Uh, some ideas here, uh, again, uh, we have the fake data here uh, because uh, if you use Faker or is you use any of these libraries that will help you with data, they will run an algorithm. And instead of running algorithms, if you have an AI assistant that analyze real data, you could have like different uh, names, not only based on an algorithm, but also based on a a artificial intelligence model that will help you to automate the world process. And uh, every time, for instance, uh, I saw that application uh, in one of uh, of the uh, Twitter threads, uh, and this girl, what the, she did is basically uh, automate the way that she tests all the different uh, app APIs that she was working on. So instead of using the same a username and everything, she generate the data using an AI and incorporate chat GPT to generate the real text and real data that is kind of the same way that a user will generate these tools and create those environments using the available chat GPT, um, well, open AI API, basically. Uh, another thing that is good with artificial intelligence and it will help a lot with the documentation because they can provide the developers some context about what is going on inside the function. And you don't need to have those huge wikis where you need to navigate and just learn everything about the code because it's hard. Instead of that, you could have some kind, these kind of tools will help you with you know some text uh, based on some text that you can write, it, it could help you to generate some text that help you in the end to understand what is going on with the code base. And not only that, uh, also uh, we have the onboarding process. And if we talk about the onboarding process, it's like a huge conversation because uh, in the startups that they are just building a product and they have a really tight um, deadline and they don't have like too much gap, generate the onboarding process is kind of chaotic. So if we have these tools and you can give enough information, uh, enough context about the company, the problem that you are working on, 
and even like uh, the source code and you can generate, give this context. So you will have enough information in, and you can use any of the tools available in order to get data and help the different, uh, the future developers to onboard quickly in your project. Um, now, the last part of the conversation will be focused in the documentation itself. Because um, if we think about the documentation, most of the time when you are talking about the documentation, you think like it's a really boring process because we don't wa we want to focus as a developer, we want to focus in the code that we are writing on. We don't want to take notes. We don't want to do um, this kind of, um, we don't want to lose time writing documentation. That's in, an, in a nutshell. So if you see instead of, I'm gonna take notes just for taking notes. But instead of that, you, you say, I'm gonna take no, notes to help me in the future. Like even better, like I'm gonna create my own personal database with the code that I have been creating before a code that I really understand because when I solved that specific problem, when I had to integrate TypeScript within that uh, form library that is not uh, is not that straightforward to understand, so I can create those kind of uh, personal database. I, I here I just put two different examples about how I create my personal database and how I'm automating the way that the the way that I take notes. The first one is Notion. I have my own personal database. Uh, I'm gonna quickly show you here. So for instance, uh, for the shorts that I wrote, I have everything here and I have this one for uh, development. So let's say on React. So this is like the different patterns that I have been using for instance here. Next, out Firebase with single servers so, uh, server side rendering. So I have this code here. So as you see, um, even like that one that I that is in a different uh, snip that I just created in order to speed up the process. But the first thing that I did in order to see what I'm gonna create is having my personal notes, and I take that that those notes, I write everything down while I'm creating my own solutions. Um, documentation. So basically, uh, the idea is you create that document and that would be your personal database. So next time that you don't remember how did you solve that specific problem, the first thing that came to, my mind, to your mind is your personal database. So you will, you will check your personal database before reaching the uh, search engine. So some ideas here. And why this is good is after you have your own documentation and you have like your own database, you can start blogging, you know? Uh, like instead of taking notes with Notion on Obsidian, how about if you create your personal blog and once a week to summarize what you just did and all, every challenge that you, you have and you explain it to the world. Maybe somebody else has the same problem that you will help them. And you will end with a nice documentation there because you just start your personal blog. Uh, one, one thing that is just an idea, but you need to be careful because, I mean, you could be in trouble, uh, but some people like to have their personal repository with information of the solution that they have been working on. So uh, let's say that they have their own private GitHub repo and they just copy and paste the code that they create and what they just find useful for the different uh, source, code that, source code that they have been working on. But again, you need to be careful here because you could be in trouble independent of the contracts and uh, that you sign and all the, uh, the legal document that you agree on when you move to that specific company. So maybe you could be in trouble if you copy the whole uh, 
co-base of Google or any of the companies. Um, finally, uh, and this is the way that I, I like to do, like if you want to take uh, notes, you can uh, start thinking about your journey log. Uh, basically, if you go to vacation and you want to remember everything that you just did, you can write down what you just did, uh, the person that you speak with and that kind of information. And you can do the same when you are creating a solution. Things like I navigate to this specific page, I find the solution, I try the solution, that solution didn't work, I have to edit it in this way. And in the future, when you review those notes, you will see, okay, this is the way that, that I solve all the, these problems. And I think I just got it now and maybe uh, if there is like a similar problem, you can do the same mental process that you just do, that you just follow in the past in order to solve this new problem that is kind of similar. And you will start, start to see your own patterns about how do you solve your problem. Um, so this is all I have right now. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, if you want to follow me a little bit more in my social network, you will see it here on the screen. Uh, I'm doing daily videos. I, I do uh, daily videos. And unfortunately, right now, all of them are in Spanish because that's a market that I've been target on. But well, if you want to learn a little bit of Spanish, or you can follow me on Programadores Anonymous. Uh, that's all I have. This is the cap. Thanks.